Welcome to Torah Today Ministries and our continuing series, Parsha Seasonings, where we look at some details in the Hebrew language, some unusual things, and then also look at the Torah scroll because there are some very strange and unique things that occur there as well. Now, some Torah portions have have more things going on that uh, fit into this series, and others have fewer. Well, this is one of those that's just absolutely chock full of things to talk about. So, uh, without further ado, let's jump right into Beshalach, which is found in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, through chapter 17, verse 16. So, let's begin in chapter 13 and verse 18. The children of Israel are going out of Egypt, and it says here in verse 18, the children of Israel went up armed from Egypt. And the word for armed is this word, kamushim, kamushim. Now, those of you who know some Hebrew recognize those, that, that, that opening word, kamush, which means five. And you may study the Torah through a book called a chomish, which is the five-fifths of the Torah, the five books of Moses. So, komish, komush means five. Now, what's interesting is that this word for being armed with a weapon and the word for five are basically the same word. Because what, after all, is our weapon? It's the Torah. And when you think about it, um, this may be what Paul was thinking of when he wrote in Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He saw the Word of God as a sword. And the writer of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 12, says the same thing. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And thinking of five and the word for weapon, I'm reminded of little David when he went and slew Goliath. The scriptures tell us in 1 Samuel 17 that when David prepared to go face Goliath, he took a sling and he went to the creek and he found five smooth stones. And these five stones were his weapon. He only needed one to kill Goliath, but he had four extra. And that also reminds me of Yeshua's temptation by Satan. You know, when Satan uh, tempted Yeshua in the wilderness, Yeshua confronted each one of his temptations by quoting Scripture. Now, he could have quoted from Genesis or Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or any place else, but he quoted only from the book of Deuteronomy. She could also say that Yeshua, the son of David, had five smooth stones, but he only needed one, and Deuteronomy did the trick, and Satan took off with his tail between his legs. Or at least that's how I like to think about it. So this interesting word, how they went up armed, tells us that they were armed with the Word of God. And um, that's how we are to go armed, with the Word of God. Now, as we go on to chapter 14, we come to a, a passage here, verses 19, 20, and 21. And I want to be careful here. I debated whether to discuss this or not, but I'm here to give you information. That's my responsibility and commitment to this endeavor. But your responsibility is to use information wisely. And the reason this passage requires a caution is because there is discussion out there that you can find in, in books and on the Internet that refers to the 72-letter name of God, the 72-letter name of God, or 72 names of God. And that is based upon this passage of three verses. It doesn't appear in the translations, but each of these verses in Hebrew is comprised of exactly 72 letters. Now, let's look at the passage. It, verse 19 says, And the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So, the Israelites are facing the sea. The Egyptians are behind them, bearing down on them. And so God moved his presence between the Egyptians and the Israelites, this pillar of cloud. 
So we see this separation taking place. The next verse says it became it came between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. The way we are to visualize this in our minds is that when the Israelites saw the cloud from their side, all they saw was cloud and darkness. But from the side of the Israelites, what they saw was light. And this cloud that was darkness to the Egyptians was a source of light for the Jewish people as they crossed the Red Sea. So we see a, a separation between light and darkness. And then the third verse, verse 21 says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Adonai drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So in the second verse, we see light and darkness separated. In the third verse, we see water separated from water. What does this remind you of? It's the creation story, isn't it? On the first day, God said, let there be light, and he separated the light from the darkness. On the second day, he separated the waters above from below, whereas here, he's separating the waters on the left from the waters on the right. And then on the third day, the dry land appeared, and we see the dry land right here. It's a creation story, isn't it? We're new creations. Israel's becoming a new creation. And so, as we give our lives to God, as we follow Him, and as especially we are set free by the body and blood of the Lamb, and we follow God into the unknown, we become new creations ourselves. And so, this language in these three verses was, no question about it, was designed by God to reflect the, the elements of the creation story in Genesis 1. Now, here are the three verses as they appear in Hebrew. And if you print out the notes, you can count the letters, and you'll notice that each of these verses, there's 19 at the top, 20 in the middle, 21 at the bottom. Each one has exactly 72 letters. Now, what some people do, they take this amazing passage about Israel being redeemed and being made a new creation. And they realize that it's no coincidence that each verse has 72 letters in Hebrew. So what they do is they take a verse from the first verse, or I'm sorry, a letter from the first verse, a letter from the second, and a letter from the third, combine them into a word of three letters, which is not really a word, and they say, this is one of the names of God. And then they'll take the next letter from each verse, and they say, this makes another name. And they combine the three verses in this very quirky and odd way to say that the 72 resulting three-letter words are 72 names for God, each one carrying with it a certain strength, uh, power, influence. And to me, it trips over a little bit into something that is a little like astrology, a little, little strange, a little weird. Therefore, the caution. But in case someone asks you about this or you've heard about this, this is where it comes from. And that's as far as I'm going with it. And um, this is one of those areas where you you look at it, but you think, hmm, not so much. So, uh, so there you go. I'll probably be getting a lot of questions on that one, huh? Now, as we continue on in chapter 14... It says, And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. The waters became a wall to them on their right and on their left. And then in chapter 15, we have the Song of the Sea. It's a beautiful hymn. And uh, Moses and Miriam, uh, Miriam leads the women in, in singing, and they have their tambourines, and they're really rejoicing because God has destroyed the Egyptian cavalry. They see the dead bodies on the shore, and it really hits home that God has truly rescued them, and they have nothing to fear from their previous enemies, their previous slave drivers. Now, when you look at chapter 15, the Song of the Sea and the Torah scroll, it's written in a very odd way. Now, normally, lines in a Torah scroll just go straight on across, like you see here. 
And the reason these are a little curvy is because our Torah scroll is a little wrinkly. And uh, I didn't, I couldn't put a book on to flatten it out because then you wouldn't be able to see what was on there. And so here is the introduction to the Song of the Sea. Then once it begins, it's right here. And you see there's a little snippet on the right. There's some in the middle and then some on the left. Now the next line has a section on the right, a section on the left. Then the next line is in three parts right, middle, left. The next line is just section on the right, section on the left. So each line overlaps the gaps in the line below it. Does this remind you of anything? If you say it reminds you of bricks in the wall, the courses of brick, you'd be exactly right. And in every Torah scroll in the world, this is how Exodus chapter 15, the Song of the Sea, is printed so that it looks like courses of brick or stone in a wall because the water stood up as a wall on the right hand and on the left hand. So it's kind of a, an amazing thing to see. I'm sure if you go online, you'll see other photographs that are, are better than this one I took of our, our own Torah scroll. Now, while we're in chapter 15, let's take a look at verse 25. They've gone across, they've sung their song, and now the tests come. And they come to a place, the people are thirsty, and they want water, and there's plenty of water, but it says the water was mara, it was bitter. So they cried out to Adonai, and uh, to Moses, and Moses calls on the Lord, and and he cried to Adonai, and Adonai, it says here, showed him a tree, an eights, a tree. And he threw it into the water, and the water became matok. That's the word for sweet, matok. There Adonai made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them. Now, I put tested in red because we're going to talk about testing quite a bit in this episode. But I want us to look at this word, matok. Now, if you know anything about the Hebrew letters, you know that this middle letter here, the letter tov, means cross. So, let's take a fanciful approach to this verse because the word for tree, eights, and the word for wood is the same word. And we say that Yeshua was crucified on the wood, and then the King James says he's crucified on the tree. It's because it's the same word. So let's take this fanciful approach and say that this tree is the cross, which is the letter Tav, after all. And it made the water sweet. What was bitter became sweet. But if we take that cross out of the middle and we're left just with the letter on the right and the letter on the left, the mem and the kof, it spells the word mock, which just so happens to mean petrification, putrefi I'm sorry, it should be putrefication and rottenness, something really, really stinky. So let's get the picture here. Mock, mem kof, means putrefication, means rottenness. In fact, this word is found over in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 24. Now it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be muck, putrefaction. And if we take that word putrefaction and throw the letter tov in the middle, which means cross, the word mock becomes matok, sweet. Coincidence? I don't think so. I believe every jot and tittle of God's Word is placed there on purpose, and I have the authority of Messiah to say so. He says not one jot or tittle will pass from the Torah till everything's fulfilled. Everything has purpose here. It, we're just catching up to it. There's so many things here still hidden from our eyes. But these things that are revealed to me are just amazing, and they encourage my faith in so many ways. Now, as we move on to chapter 16, in verse 4, we read this. Then Adonai said to Moses, Behold, <clears throat> I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. This bread from heaven, of course, is the manna. 
and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my Torah or not. So I have two uh, parts in red here. The first is the word portion. That word portion that is used is the word devar. And the word devar actually means word. Now, what we're going to be getting at here is the manna, this bread from heaven, is always something that pictures the word. You know, God says man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. So here we are as souls, we have physical bodies, and you've heard me talk about this many times before. We have physical bodies that require physical food and we enjoy eating that physical food. But we also have a spirit and our spirit and soul requires spiritual food. And so the bread comes from the earth, but the manna, the spiritual food comes from above. And we need both, we need to feed both. We want to be strong physically and strong spiritually. We have to have a good physical and a good spiritual diet. So to me, it's not any coincidence that the word for a day's portion is also the word for word. We need the daily word of God. But you might think, well, wait a minute, over in John's gospel, Yeshua refers to himself as the bread that comes from heaven. Well, sure, because he is the Word made flesh. So, of course, he refers to himself as the manna. Anything that you can say about the Word of God also applies to the Word made flesh, to Yeshua himself. But this manna is given to them that God may also test them, whether they will walk on my Torah or not. Now, let me tell you something about testing. We test things so we can get information. I would test students in school, so that way it becomes a, a measuring device to see how much that student has studied and how much they have learned. And until I see the test results, I don't really know how much they've learned. And sometimes neither do they. So in the physical world, a test is to discover information. But God knows everything already. He doesn't need a test to find out anything. What God does when he sends a test is to reveal, to reveal what is already in a person so that person can see, that person can know what's inside of them. God already knows. But he issues challenges to reveal those hidden potentials in a person, those things that are latent in a person to awaken them and bring them forth. For example, until your courage is tested, you may not ever think of yourself as a courageous person. And there are many stories in history where someone who's thought to be brave, when they were put to the test, it was revealed they were a coward. Whereas another person who never thought of themselves as being all that brave, when they're actually tested, something awakens with them. Some potential is revealed and the world sees what courage they had. So for God, a test is a way of revealing to us and awakening within us those potentials that lie latent and also to elevate us. So let's go back to our word. I may test them is one word in Hebrew. It's anasenu. And the key here are the second and third letters, which spell nes. And nes means to raise up. It's also the word for miracle, by the way. Sometimes we think when we pass the test, it's a miracle. But what is a miracle? A miracle is when the spiritual reveals itself above the laws, the so-called laws of nature. And when we pass a test, when we see individuals in the scriptures passing the test that God puts them on, uh, uh, puts on them, we see something miraculous happen. This person of flesh and blood is rising above their physical natures and the spiritual is being revealed and it's put on display. And that is indeed a nace, a miracle. But 
foundationally, fundamentally, the word nace means to elevate. There's a, a wonderful book I'm reading right now, about halfway through. It's called People of the Word. It just came out. And the author's name is Mendel Kalmanson. Mendel Kalmanson, K-A-L-M-E-N-S-O-N. And I, I, I highly recommend this book. If the second half is as good as the first, it's, it's definitely a keeper. And he writes about this word, testing. And this is what he says. A test is God's way of saying, you're ready for the next level. When you search for God and encounter an obstacle, do not try to avoid it or seek to go around or even over it. For God himself is to be found within that very obstacle. So again, a test is God's way of saying, you're ready for the next level. And I'm reminded of, of what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 about how there's no testing. We translate it temptation, but every temptation is a test. But I think test is the pure translation of the word. There's no testing that's taken you, but such as is common to man. And then he goes on to say, and God will show you a way through it. King James has mingled the translation. They say that God will show you a way of escape. And if that's what you believe you're supposed to do when you're tested, is find a way to escape, you've got it dead wrong. That's like the kid who realizes, oh, I have a test today. I'm going to skip school. No, that doesn't work. We are to go through the test. And what it says in the Greek is God will show you the way through. He'll provide an outcome. So you go through it, just as uh, Kamelson says here. You don't go around it or over it. You don't try to avoid it. You go through it. You come out the other end and you've been elevated. So this nace has produced nace, an elevation. We're going to see another meaning for this word nace in just a moment. But let's continue on in chapter 16. Now you come down to verse 16, chapter 16, verse 16. It says, this is what Adonai has commanded. Gather of it, the manna, each one of you, as much as he can eat. And this applies to the word of God. Eat as much as you can. And people have different appetites. It might be just a verse you need because you go so deep into that verse and it speaks so much to you, it satisfies you. Another person might need to study a chapter or two. So don't be comparing appetites. Eat till you're full. As much as he can eat, you shall each take an omer, that's a, a, a measuring amount, a measuring basket, according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. Here is that verse in Hebrew. The reason I'm showing it to you is because it's the first verse in the Bible we come to that contains all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And isn't that appropriate? That this verse, which talks about eating the heavenly bread, the manna, the eat till you're full. And what is the manna? It's the word of God. That's what it's a picture of. So this verse telling us to eat the manna is the first verse. It contains all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. There's a, another quote I want to share with you by Jacob Ben Asher. Um, and it says, the Torah was given solely to those who eat manna. These people who are learning to eat this bread they collect each morning, this bread from heaven. It's these people to whom God gives his Torah. The two are connected. The manna eaters get the Torah. And you know, there are a lot of people today who read the Torah, but they never really read the Torah. They read the words and they may study Hebrew, and they may write books about uh, geography and, uh, and how to translate words and enlisting the commandments and write about the historical background, but they've never encountered the life-giving word of God in the Torah. It's like a scientist who takes a piece of man and studies it, make, its makeup, but never really feeds on it. The Torah... The living word of God is given only to the manna eaters. If you only look at God's word as something to go in your head, to increase your knowledge, to gain some facts, then you really haven't studied the word of God. The scriptures, yes, 
but the Word of God, no. You must feed upon the Word. You must go to it to derive life from it. And we need to pray, God, show me yourself. Give me something of yourself as I feed upon your Word. And somehow, when you really connect with God through the Scriptures, then you know you've really connected with God through the Scriptures. And I hope that all of you listening to this aren't listening just so you can get more knowledge, though knowledge is good. But I hope you develop an appetite to truly be fed in your soul and your spirit in a way that will make you stronger spiritually, that it will change your soul, that it will bring you your life and your thinking more in a line with our creators. Okay, well, let's move on. Chapter 17. You know, in the first few tests, the, the water that was bitter, and then there was nothing to eat, and God sends the manna. They, then they came to a place where there's no water at all, and God instructs Moses to strike the rock, and he provides water. You know, in all of these tests, and all of the people's whining, God never corrects them. He doesn't get angry with them. He doesn't rebuke them. He realizes they are like spiritual infants, and infants cry. It's just what they are. And, but when we become adults, we should not whine and cry over the small things. But then they came to a place where they complained, and then God really had it, and he sent Amalek after them. And the thing that really angered God is when they said, after all these miracles, all this deliverance, the parting of the Red Sea, the plagues of Egypt, the providing of bread from heaven and water from a rock, they said, is God with us or not? And the next moment you see Amalek attacking. Amalek throughout the Torah means the flesh, the appetites of the flesh. And when we begin to doubt God's presence with us, the flesh will rise up to become a presence in our life in a way that is never pleasant. This is when God got angry. And one of the things we should never do is test God. And the way you can really test him and make him angry, say, is God with me or not? Really? After all the things you've been through that God's delivered you from, you're asking if he's with you? So Amalek attacks. I'm sorry, I got on a little rant there, but now let's pick it up. Chapter 17, verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Amalek, by the way, means the Am, um, the people of Lek, of licking up, people of licking up. What a picture of the, uh, the fleshly appetites. It says, tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Now, the reason I bring out this verse, because this is the very first time we see Joshua mentioned in the scriptures. Very first time his name is found. And we know that Joshua and Yeshua are the same name. And as we read about Joshua, we see foreshadowings of Yeshua. And then as you get to the book of Yahshua, uh, we're reading the things that strongly foreshadow Yeshua. And it's interesting to me that the first mention of his name is when it comes to battle. It takes me back to the opening of this episode where we see that, that the people went up a komushim. They went up armed. And that word armed means five. They had the five books of, to uh, of Torah. And that is our weapon the sword of the Spirit. And so when the weapon comes out, when it's time to use weapons, we see Joshua appear on the scene. I know that Yeshua is the Lamb of God who has been slain. And I know that when John in Revelation turns and he looks behind him, he sees a lamb as if it had been slain. But that's the appearance the essence of this lamb is that of a lion. Because in Revelation, John hears a voice and says, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. He turns around, what he sees is a lamb. But what it is, is a lion. Don't be deceived by the genuine meekness and humility of Yeshua. Don't be deceived into thinking that that's all there is to him. 
He is a lion. He is a lion. That is his nature. But he controls his nature through meekness and he keeps it under control. He keeps himself approachable. But don't you ever doubt for a second that he is indeed a lion. And so we see Yeshua, Joshua, Yahashua, first mentioned when it comes to Israel's first warfare after leaving Egypt. Well, let's move on a bit further. Well, they have a victory over Amalek, and they'll have many more encounters with Amalek over the years. But after this victory, in, in chapter 17, verse 15, it says, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, Adonai is my banner. In Hebrew, it's Adonai Nisi. You recognize those two letters? Those are the same two letters, Nase, which means to lift up, to be tested, and also miracle. It's also the word for banner. Because after all, a banner is lifted up. And what's the purpose of a banner? To communicate information that we have won. We are victorious. This is who we are. It reveals whose side is whose. You don't get the enemy and the friendlies mixed up if you can see their banners. So again, God's testing in your life is his means of elevating you and of becoming Adonai Nisi, Adonai my banner. He wants us to experience victory and he wants to elevate us. He wants to reveal the latent potentials within us and that's only going to happen through testing. And you can do it. You can get through it. Even though when you do, you might say it was a miracle. But it's all part of the same thing. Well, I hope that this, this episode, which is a little crowded, I know it's gone longer than most, but uh, not too bad, 32 minutes. But I hope it's been a blessing to you. I've uh, I tried to pack quite a bit in. There's a lot going on here in just the details of the Hebrew and, and as we saw in the Torah scroll itself. And, uh, but I hope that these jots and tittles will be something that will just enlighten your eyes and, uh, and draw you deeper into God's Word. And that you'll never study His, His scriptures just for information, but you'll study them also for food, for true spiritual food and nourishment so we can go, grow strong in the Lord and become the people He wants us to be. So, the next time, I wish you shalom and may God bless. Thank you for joining us for today's teaching. If the work of Torah Today Ministries has touched your life, please consider making a donation or sponsoring an upcoming video. As a video sponsor, you'll have an exclusive opportunity to memorialize a family member, celebrate a special event, or simply support the ongoing creation of similar content. Your tax-deductible contribution helps ensure that our teachings continue to reach all who are longing for truth. Click the link or visit our website to learn more. Amen.